that there was a tradition, and that's why you, met, you mentioned Eton Thomas, I believe, drooling over basketball players who say poetry. But like to, to look at any athlete like Eton who consciously sees themselves as part of a tradition, to me is very stirring. Like you say, hey, there's this tradition out here, I don't want it to die, and therefore I'll stand in it. Yeah. And, and it's courageous because ultimately it's futile. Uh, there's no question that Ali and um, Tommy and John, whom you tend to conflate, I see them very, very differently. You know, I like one a lot, I don't like the other. Uh, and, and I think that their motivations have always been very different. But, um, I mean, the point was that crushing Ali and crushing Tommy Smith and Carlos really, in a sense, brought us to the narcissism of Michael Jordan. Well, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would argue that the 1980s and the Reagan years brought us to the narcissism of Michael Jordan. I mean, this idea that, that money matters more than people, what Dr. King called the thingifying of the United States. I mean, that's what brought us to Michael Jordan. This idea that you keep score by how much money you make, which is really the Jordan way, which a lot of athletes have chosen to stand in. But I'll tell you why I think um, Ali, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Billy Jean King, why, why it's not futile is because it still lives. I mean, the mere fact that we're talking about it. I mean, it's like that old expression about the labor movement being a subterranean fire and that you could stamp on it, you know, and behind you, in front of you, you could stamp on it, but still flames will shoot up. I mean, that's the thing about it. I mean, to hear someone like LeBron James, who I, a great basketball player, who I see as being kind of torn by different instincts, certainly more towards the Michael Jordan of, I want to make as much money as possible. But LeBron James, in the same interview, can say and see that there's no contradiction in this. I want to be the first billionaire athlete, and I want to be a global icon like Muhammad Ali. And he can say both of these things. And he's a guy, you know, he's a young man, you know. He's yeah, yeah, but no, come on, come on, come on. He's, he's not talking about the Muhammad Ali that you're talking about. No, that's true. He's, he's talking true. about this, um, this secular saint made neutered and made non-threatening. Right, but, but, but the point is, is that, you know, sometimes uh, trees start as saplings in a way. I mean, I, because he even said that, I was very fortunate to be able, just as an example, to write a column for Slam Magazine, and there's some people here tonight from Slam Magazine, and you know, Slam Magazine is, um, <laughs> okay, there's people like Slam Magazine. Um, there's a, and, and write a column that just says, okay, LeBron James, you say this, but you should know that Muhammad Ali is not an icon because of the money he made, he's an icon for what he sacrificed. And to actually use it as an opportunity to teach people the real history is that Muhammad Ali is still an icon in so much, certainly, of course, in the global south especially, because he's someone who is seen as standing up to America, not, not embracing it in the way that uh, LeBron James may see it. And I think you're totally right about that. I'm not trying to project political aspirations on him that otherwise would not be there. But I am trying to say that any time that, that subterranean fire, any time it shoots up, it provides us with the marvelous opportunity to educate that otherwise would not be there. And if people hadn't struggled in the past, then the opportunity to educate and fight for the future would not exist. Mm -hmm. Well, do you see a real movement now? Uh, in sports? Yeah. I, I see a rumbling that did not exist 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's promising. And it, it would be very easy to poo-poo it for what it's not. Oh, it's not 1968. But I prefer to like, recognize it for what it is. And I mean, in the 90s, it was a, a very ugly time. I mean, we mentioned Mahmoud abdul Rauf. You also could mention Craig Hodges, another obscure uh, basketball player, three-point specialist with the Chicago Bulls, who was really drummed out of the league after uh, handing a letter to George W. Not no, George H. W. Bush. I got to get my Bush. George Bush the Elder handed him a letter at a White House ceremony outlining why he opposed the war in Iraq. That was Craig Hodges, uh, drummed out of the league. Um, I'm going to have the root drummed out of the league. And you talk to NBA players today, which I, I'm able to do, and they all know those guys. They all know them. And you assume it's their agent pounding it into their head. Don't end up like Craig Hodges or Mahmoud Abdul-Rabu. And you know, it's pounded into their head. You must know these names. Um, 
But what's happening now, I think, is that there's a, a broader crisis in our society. And I think as much as athletes live in gated communities and behind armies of uh, anabolic bodyguards, they don't live on planet jock as much as they try to. And so at the end of the day, when you have something like Hurricane Katrina, and when you have a remarkably disproportionate amount of athletes who are from the Gulf region, I mean, that cannot help but resonate. And I've talked with athletes about this from the Gulf, but I really would recommend to people a book by Bill Roden called $40 Million Slaves, where a uh, terrific, like yourself, New York Times, or I you know formally, but you know, Bill Roden at the New York Times, and he has a whole section of the book about traveling to the Gulf with several dozen uh, pro athletes who are from there. And it, it's stunning, and it shows the way that they try to isolate themselves, but how isolating yourself, frankly, when you do come from poverty, is at the end, it can be futile. Yeah, well, there's no, there's no question that that like that really right. uh, provoked them. But the, the difference really in the 60s, particularly among football and basketball players who went to college, uh, was that they were in a climate where their peer group uh, were activists and yeah. further. I mean, not not to denigrate those who did, but you know, it was it was part of. Um, I, I remember I remember football players saying, black football players in particular, talking about going to left wing meetings and parties, which could really pick up girls there. Um, how do you compartmentalize? I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. the one, the one thing you know, I, I've always felt was that you're so much more of a passionate and sophisticated sports fan than I am. But I wonder, how do you compartmentalize your, you know, your real understanding of what LeBron does with your feelings about what he's not? I mean, how do you, how do you balance the, the, the political and the fandom? That's a good question. Um, first, just a quick story. I just I had to respond to just one thing you said earlier, though. It's like, you said, you, I, I totally agree with what you said about the 1960s were the 1960s, and that's a profoundly, you have to have the largest social upheaval in the last 50 years is a variable when looking why, why athletes are more or less political. And then there's a story in the book I have about Calvin Hill, who is a, a running back with the Dallas Cowboys, who's the father of Grant Hill, is how he's actually probably best known at this point the basketball player. Calvin Hill had the story of being a football player at Yale. And it's really kind of funny. It's like he showed up to be a quarterback and they made him a running back. And, and there were immediately a whole group of students, black and white, and it was Yale, so it was majority white, who showed up and they, were, they said to Calvin Hill, they said, hey, so we're gonna do a protest? You should be the quarterback. This is racism. So we're gonna do the protest, right? We're gonna do the protest, right? And he was just still trying to learn the playbook. And he was just like, huh, what, protest? Oh, okay. I, I, I get what you know, and so to have like you know that kind of immediate political access to people who want to to do something. I mean, I think is a different climate than the one. Well, I mean, we even even Ali really became a political person in college. He didn't go to college, but after his his uh, title was stripped, uh, the only way that he could make money, one of the major ways he could make money, was on the college concert tour. You know, he went to college and, and spoke. And in the beginning, he was, he really bombed. Yeah. You know, he, he, he'd make kind of side comments about, oh, I'm getting a contact high, you know, and you know, all the heads would leave. And then he'd make, you know, remarks about, you know, the interracial couples, you know, Redbirds should stay with Redbirds and Bluebirds with Bluebirds, the interracial couples were all. But in, in the question and answers afterwards, he slowly began to find out who the Viet Cong were and what the war was really all about. When, when he was first told that um, he had lost his uh, 2S status and was going to be drafted, his first response was, I was there, his first response was, why me? You know, I'm heavyweight champion of the world with my tax money I buy all these tanks, and guns, and helmets. Why don't they draft poor boys in Louisville? They'll be happy to go. That was his first reaction. So I mean, his evolution really came, in many ways, was the evolution of the athletes who were on campus in the 60s, like, like Carlos and, and Smith. 
Uh, so it was, you know, within 